My name is not Joe, and I don't work in a factory. But I have a house, no dog, but a family. I'm a professor, and I'm an executive coach. I'm an author, a mother, a sister, a partner, a daughter, a friend. I hold a license in psychotherapy, and now I give a TED talk. You can imagine that the question, how do you get it all under one roof, hits me quite often. For a very long time, I just shrugged with my shoulders, and I said, hmm, well, I don't know, I guess it just works. Today I know that's a big lie. Combining different roles and tasks in our life is everything except coincidence. It's not done with just leaning in, as Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg suggests. She also says it's all about the right partner. Well, he doesn't help if he walks away, right? It's a complex strategy. It's a life principle, which I call the tailor your life principle. It actually consists of many different strategies that those people successfully apply who make it all work. And what does successful mean in that context? Well, it means they are doing all of those things without feeling worn out, without suffering from a bad conscience, without permanently thinking about what they are missing in their lives, without feeling sorry for themselves. How do I know? Well, a while ago I conducted an online survey. I tried to find out what those happy work-life balancers, those champions in compatibility, do differently from those who aren't satisfied with the combinations of their various obligations in life. This group was a rather small group, 40 actually, out of 196 participants. I also talked to some of those successful people, people in leadership positions, who had kids or other care duties, who had hobbies, friends, or were engaged in social projects. I tried to find out whether what they do is somehow related to my own strategies. And today I can say, yeah, that's the case. So let me share some of the secrets. Secret number one. If you want to get it all under one roof, the first thing I can recommend, throw away your work-life balance. When I am invited to talks, usually people believe I'm the work-life balance queen. They also believe that my life must be in a total equilibrium, that I manage to dedicate 50% of my lifetime to my private matters and 50% to my business duties. Well, that's not the case. But you know what? I couldn't care less. And you know why? Because I don't believe in that whole concept of work-life balance. I actually think it's a total cheat. Now, let me explain why. According to the German Ärzteblatt, one out of two Germans are afraid to suffer from burnout in the near future. Six out of ten feel continuously exhausted. And a good work-life balance is a key criterion for many employees when they are looking out for a new job. However, measures taken by companies to improve the work-life balance of their employees, such as increased home office op options or digital detox areas, yoga and meditation sessions, all great. However, they are by no means enough to really prevent people from feeling off balance. And you know why? Because they are aiming at achieving a state that is a complete illusion. What the hell is work-life balance? Let's look at that concept. First of all, it suggests two poles on a scale that, from my point of view, simply do not exist. That is, usually those who work live, right? Or have you ever had your hair done by a dead hairdresser? Well, I haven't. I haven't seen one alive due to the pandemic either, but that's a different story. Anyway, second question I have. How can anyone actually decide what belongs into the pan of life and what belongs into the pan of work? People who believe that life does not mean work obviously haven't had the fun yet to have kids in puberty, old parents, bored friends or train for a marathon. Where does my tax declaration go? I'm confused. Next, what do you think about this current definition of work-life balance as here in the Cambridge Dictionary? It says, the amount of time you spend doing your job as compared with the amount of time you spend with your family and doing things you enjoy. According to this, it is basically impossible to enjoy the time you spend with your job. To me, that's simply not true. Sitting in my quiet office on an early Monday morning after a packed weekend with my puberty kids, it's absolutely recreational. So dividing our life into two parts, where one gets the role of the evil and the other one of the good, I don't think that makes sense at all.
I believe that a concept like this will even hinder us from being satisfied. Easily we are reviled as workaholics, playing in the same league as drug addicts. <laughs> and sense that too much work is super unhealthy and automatically makes us unhappy. Yet, one of the most robust findings out of the World Happiness Report from 2017 is that unemployment is destructive to people's well-being. And this is true for people all over the world. The employed evaluate the quality of their lives much more highly on average than the unemployed. Individuals who are unemployed also report around 30% more negative feelings in their day-to-day -day lives. So work actually is connected to enjoyment. And the last thing I don't like about this common model of work-life balance is that the idea of a balance implies that the answer to satisfaction lies in an equal distribution. Consequently, I could conclude that the more time I need um, for my work, the more time I need to invest in my private duties. Honestly, I did this for a very long time. So I was working eight to nine hours approximately a day. Afterwards, I ran to the supermarket to buy some healthy food. I cooked some dinner, I picked up my kids, I played with them, and then I hustled to my yoga class. You know what? On the surface, my life really was all in balance. However, I really, really felt exhausted. It was only my decision to not balance out full working days with social or recreational pursuits or not work that much on a day that I wanted to have more time for myself. That finally led to some kind of inner harmony. So here's my secret number two. Instead of balancing things out in your life according to that 888 recipe, eight hours of sleep, eight hours of business, eight hours of private time, try to find your personal mix. Replace the through a patchwork quilt. Associate with patchwork. Maybe something like colorful, dynamic. Maybe something like imperfect. Well, yeah, it's a mixture of different things. And I think this is how we should see our lives. Actually, the tasks that we do stand for the different patches. And the good thing is patchwork quilt is anything else but perfect. It's individual. There's no master plan. However, I think there are three things that you need to consider before you start sewing. First of all, you need to know a one colored patchwork quilt is not a patchwork quilt, which means that you should at least integrate a couple of different patches. And if you look at what makes people happy besides a paid job, it's deep relationships and frequently time for yourself. You can spend that time with creative hobbies, with sports, I don't care. As Sigmund Freud already said, love and work are the cornerstones of our humanness. And I think you also need some time for yourself. Second, you should be aware that you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. What does that mean? Well, actually, you have to look at your goals. You have to look at what you want to achieve. And that needs to be coherent with your current life design. So if you want to stand there on your 70th birthday and you want your kids to tell nice stories about how you spend time with them, you certainly need to integrate a patch like this in your current life design. Now, if you want to integrate a new patch into your life, either because you are getting a child or you're climbing into the leadership position or you do have to do some care work, then you will certainly have to sort out one patch one or the other, or at least decrease some of them in size. So what does that mean? The third rule is our day only has 24 hours, 168 hours a week, and that's the framework you need to stick to. And that's what immediately takes me to the third secret of people who make it all work. And that's the aspect that they have learned how to prioritize. You know, when I received the invitation to this TED talk, two days ago, no joke, one hour before midnight, Thursday night. Actually, I had a completely full calendar, but after quickly checking to talk to you and reflect upon how that talk would be in line with my future plans, with my values, my passion, I decided to cancel everything else and prepare for the talk. To be here tonight means that I cannot be with my family. And uh, this is because I'm not Harry Potter. So you can only do one thing at a, at a time, and that means you need to take decisions. So if anyone on Monday asks me, how did you manage to do that tech talk? I will say, by decision taking. So here it is. Taking wise decisions is one secret that people really do who get it all under one roof. 
I just live by the rule, you can't have it all at once, but many things one after the other. Getting many things under one roof means taking wise decisions. And how do you get those wise decisions? By introspection, naturally. So you really have to find out what do you want in your life. Be true to yourself. Each time something new will come in, in each time you feel overburdened, clarify for yourself which of those tasks do deserve your priority because they're in line with your personal goals. And that should also make it much easier for you to focus on the things that you do. And that's the next secret that successful people do who get it all under one roof. It's concentration or focus. If they have decided to do something, they will really concentrate on that. Mind wandering, multitasking, that's not their thing. So practically, they will stick with one aspect that they do. They won't give up quickly. They will just stay in the moment. If they play with their kids, maybe only one hour a day, they will not on the, talk on the phone. They will not check their emails if they are in a video conference. No, they commit impulse control. They will certainly just stay there and focus. The last secret hint that I can share with you today is that successful people who make it all work take responsibility. In my coaching practice, I deal with a lot of people who are very unhappy with the designs of their lives. There is the manager who feels that he never finds enough time for his family because his job won't allow him to leave his office early. There is the part-time worker who tells me that she can't climb the career ladder because she has small kids. Some of them feel that they suffer from a poor work-life balance because their company doesn't allow for enough flexibility or their partner doesn't support them enough. Listening to them, I frequently get the impression that they are not the designers of their own quilt, but simply the owners. All these people do is find reasons for why their life isn't the way they want. So by giving other people a certain kind of responsibility of their life design. Yet when talking to them a bit longer, I often find out that the problem is a completely different one. They simply do not live the life that they want to live. They live the life which they believe is expected of them. And that's very often related to what they saw their parents do. A research study conducted by Jona Lupu showed that even though many individuals consciously aspired to have a more balanced life, many continue to reproduce an ethos of hard work and sacrificing family life. This suggests that our beliefs formed during our childhood shape our later choices and we often end up in reproducing the status quo even if it's against our own deep desires. In other words, the barriers to spend our lifetime like we want to spend it often do not lie in organizations or society but within ourselves. We consciously or unconsciously repeat what our parents did or we do the very opposite and we are very unhappy with it. Yet, we can only make significant changes in the direction of the lives that we want to live by finding out whether there is a gap between our unconscious ambitions and our conscious expect expectations and beliefs. This means if you want to feel balanced in your life, you first have to be true to yourself. What does really matter to you? How would you your life to be? In a second step, ask yourself, what can you do to contribute to come closer to the design that you want? For today, simply remember, the one and only designer of your patchwork quilt, that is you. So throw away the balance, get a needle and a thread, and tailor your life to fly according to your own instructions.